Yeah, it's always casual. Hey guys, welcome back to the Performance Cast with uh, Dr. Sean, Dr. Jeremy. Today we're going to be talking to Olympic weightlifting coach and former Olympic weightlifting athlete, Joe Gazio. So Joe, why don't you tell them a little bit about you, what your experience is athletically, and then coaching. Sure. Well, thank you, Sean, for inviting me. Um, I've been a weightlifter uh, for about 40 years now. And uh, my, I was a national level weightlifter. I was a New York State champion, Empire State game champion. I was very fortunate to be coached by some of uh, former Soviet uh, Union coaches. Um, one of my coaches, Daum Kilmansky, who was actually a professor in the Institute of Physical Culture of Kiev. Uh, another coach was Misha Kamen, Kamel, which actually was one of the top uh, coaches, uh, lifters, uh, Pisarenko and Natalie uh, and Anton Antonio uh, Pisarenko, who was actually probably one of the best super heavyweights of all time. I believe he was the only super heavyweight to actually clean and jerk double body weight. He was your he was one of the students of your coaches. He was one of my coaches also. He came to the United States. Okay. So I was very fortunate to have uh, to have very good exposure. Sure. Yes. So you said you were a national level weightlifter yes, when you I were was. here. What kind of weight were you slinging around? I w uh, my best snatch is 341, and my best cleaning jerk is 424. And what, what were you weighing when you did that? About 218. Nice. That was some good no, numbers. it was okay. Um, unfortunately, I did have certain issues in my life, uh, family issues, where I never reached my potential. Uh, the, the athletes that, that trained with me at Lost Battalion Hall where I came knew I had a lot more potential uh, because of my strength. My strength was a lot more than what I lifted. I power cleaned uh, almost 190 kilos. I muscle snatched 130. 190 kilos, that's what, 418? About almost 418. Actually, okay. 416, I actually power cleaned. Okay. That's uh, quick math, by the way. You like that math? Yeah. <laughs> um, I muscle snatched 130, back squatted 300 kilos, 660, and okay. deadlifted 750. Okay. So my physical strength was a lot more, or I did a SOTS press, if you know what a SOTS yeah, press, yeah. of 130 kilos. In the front? I did it behind the head in the squat position. At 130 kilos, yes, so 286 pounds. pounds right. <laughs> so okay. the feats of strength was a lot more. I also did a power clean, snatch grip, straight leg with 180 kilos. So you would have been an Instagram phenomenon if you well, were around if, during the Instagram time. If, uh, <laughs> if I had my head together, I probably could have been like totaling. I had enough ability to total about 400 kilos. Okay, and no, for some perspective, where, right. where was that back then? Back then was like a, a world-class athlete. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, I, I did not take an opportunity. My coach got me into <laughs> the Institute of Physical Culture of Moscow, okay. which I didn't go at the time. It was 1983. Uh, I was a little bit nervous because it was in the middle of the Cold War. I kind of regret it today because I think that training with athletes who had the same physical strength and I saw that I wasn't lifting as much would right. help me get to achieve that goal. But oh, I can't listen. bring back the past. That's okay. <laughs> the, your, your mistakes as an athlete make exactly. you a better coach. Well, what I want to do now is that's exactly what I made a lot of mistakes. I did not reach my potential when I should have. So what I like to do now is actually help a lot of the athletes if they do kind of mistakes and try to avoid the same things I've done. Well, 83, you're still crapping in diapers. I yeah. I didn't grab the athlete. diapers until the end of eighty. Maybe I should have. <laughs> I should have gave the year me. <laughs> That's right. So so uh, we know you were lifting in eighty three. You've been doing it a while. If, 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 in the eighties, all throughout the eighties. And if we load up a barbell in the gym right now, what could you back squat? Uh, I did the other. I could still squat about five hundred. Five hundred pounds. Yeah. At fifty eight years old. Fifty seven. I'm sorry, but fifty eight. I did the other day. I did the other day a six pause squat. What's a six pause squat? What does uh, that mean? You go down. What you do is you go down slowly, stop, go down again, stop six times and at the bottom you stop for five seconds and come up for one that sounds terrible with uh 205 kilos 205 kilos Four. <laughs> a pause, okay. that's a pause squat yeah, yeah. Stop. that's, that's a real pause yeah. squat that's just hanging yeah. out at the bottom of the i haven't even rolled 451 around the gym huh? i probably could be our later put it no, on the bar and roll it the athletes <laughs> who know me from like i said from the 80s they know me they will they will tell you that i was probably the strongest 100 kilo lifter in the country but unfortunately w was never able to accomplish the lifts uh, you know and it was nothing wrong technical my technique was perfect it was just things a lot of things were going on in my life all right so the training doesn't line up the mental game isn't the there those the mental game wasn't there listen it, it happens yeah um but so let's talk about your training and now your training methodology with the athletes that you work with and yeah. tell us how 
if you're taking someone who enjoys weightlifting but isn't good at weightlifting, right? Like there's a lot of people in CrossFit, which is most people who watch our, our videos and, right. and follow our programming, who they're in CrossFit and they want to get good at weightlifting, right? What are you going to do with an athlete that, that they're probably not doing right now? What, what, is it, what, do you, what does it take to be a good weightlifter? As well, opposed to a good weightlifting CrossFitter. To be a good weightlifter, you first you have to first listen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And the hardest part of I guess coaching now CrossFit is is breaking old habits. Okay. So you have to really spend a lot of time and a lot of repetition going over it until they break the habit. A lot of habits I do see where a lot of CrossFitters do. Uh, they do. They use a lot of them use their arms. They don't know how to release themselves from the bar. So talk uh, about that for a second. You say release themselves from the bar. I don't know if a lot of CrossFitters have yes, heard that terminology. It's, Hendrix definitely has them. No. <laughs> so if you could release explain yourself that. Release yourself from the bar. Which weightlifting is a sport where you're actually throwing a weight and catching it. And what I mean by that is you're getting a weight to a certain height. And before the bar drops, you're getting under it. Um and the only way you're going to get under it is to is to release it. You can't hold on to the weight. You're holding on to it just just to hold it, but you have to release it to give yourself enough time to get under it. And a lot of CrossFitters I notice, uh, especially with uh, CrossFitters and weightlifting, they don't know how to jump under the weight. And okay. what I mean by that is bring their knees up to the chest. Okay. Once they once they accomplish or finish the second pull. They have to keep the bar close to the body and actually get their knees up to the chest to beat the bar down. So what's a good way for a CrossFit or anybody to practice getting their knees to their chest like that? Because you, you see people set up like a weight on each side of their feet. They draw lines on the floor. They try to jump their feet out. What, what kind of right. things do you have them do? Those are the drills that the, like Mike, I, I've done many years ago. Like cloak off, you see some of the lifters do. They do um, snatches and they jump onto the plate. That teaches you to jump. Right. But the best, the best way to learn how to jump or bring your knees up to your <clears> chest <throat> is doing box jumps. You see the box jumps we do? You, you see to get to the top box, you have to bring your knees up to your chest. So when you talk about box jumps, you're not talking about the box jumps that we see at the CrossFit Games where they're they're on, off, on, off. What kind no. of box jumps are you talking you're about? You're talking about getting to the box to a certain height and to get to that top level you have to bring your knees up to your chest okay. so it's a drill actually to get your knees up to your chest and learn how to relax your legs to get your knees up to your chest it's like sprinters too the fast how does the sprinter come off the blocks they have to bring their knees up to the chest the quicker you do that the faster you are the same thing in weightlifting the faster you get your knees up the quicker you are under the bar so you're saying a weightlifter should actively be bringing his as soon as that bar is at maximum, is at maximum height, height you're jumping under it that's the only that's the fastest way to jump under it is bring your knees up to your so it's, it's it's a lot of people have heard jumping under the bar i don't think a lot right. of people have heard bring your bring knees, your knees up. up well so yeah. so do you think that's as, as good of a cue for anybody as anything else is bars up now bring your knees to your chest your knees to your right think about doing the box jump Right. Tell them because when you when they do a box jump, they do it automatically. Right. So I try to cue them. Look, because yeah. they're not afraid a few hundred pounds are gonna fall on them. Except, right. We're doing so, the baby. We're doing the baby handoff. Now he's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, baby. <laughs> so the best way to cue them is think about tell them. Listen, think about that box jump you did. How you bring your knees up to your chest. Okay. And the same thing. Some athletes might be too tight, and you have to work on flexibility. You know, but right. basically, but basically. The whole idea is to tell them, look, you got to bring your knees up to your chest. All right, keep the bar close, elbows up, and release yourself from the bar. Okay. Well, because we talk about flexibility a lot. Yeah. Um, wh what do you what do you find as like a minimum, you know, minimum capacity flexibility for so even to say a clean that you're looking for with your your athletes? Well, the flexibility, they have to work on flexibility, of course. The flexibility mm -hmm. is to sit as low as you can okay. in a squat position. Mm -hmm. The lower you sit, the less you have to pull it. Right. So that, that's where, where you have to make sure that your athletes are, you know, they work on flexibility every day. Mm -hmm. And and also, it's, it's, it's hard to say this. Some people are just born with more flexibility than others. Right. Sure. And you might be limited. Right. That, but that's something you have to work at it. But I look at right now, can they keep their heels flat? They're not going up on their toes. Are they keeping the back mm -hmm. tight? So it's, it's, a, it's a, 
it's flexibility throughout the whole body. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the things that I personally see a lot is people who have all that flexibility, then you throw some weight on them and they don't use it, right? So now they go, so, so they squat past parallel, so they're down at what they consider right. the bottom of the squat, then they catch a clean and it's, it's a much lower spot than where they squat to. So when you are having somebody squat, are you having them squat to all the way to the basement? Or what all are we the way doing to the there? basement. Everything is full range of motion. You'll notice that a lot of people who have great natural flexibility, they lack strength. Right. That's also, mm -hmm. so that's why they seem to collapse under it. They're not, you know, flexibility and strength. The person who's very, you know, is very strong, you notice they're a little bit tighter because mm -hmm. the muscles are very toned. Mm -hmm. You want a combination of both. So the person you'll see that sometimes is it the problem that they're not used to the bottom position or is the body just weak? So you have to strengthen it so they have more stability. Because mm -hmm. someone who's very flexible, you see like Gumby, they just, they just fall on the bottom and they, it's hard for them to keep that position. Sure. So you have to work on the, the turtle shell. It, that's exactly right. So you're giving people who are very flexible, extremely flexible, are, are kind of like a little bit on the weak side. They need more tone. Okay. And the, and the person the, or the athlete who's kind of by strong by nature need to do more stretching. So also, would you, to, to answer your question, if they're collapsing under the bar, is it the bar crashing on them? Are they over pulling it? Right. That's what I see most of the time. What do you so, mean by that? All right. The difference between the snatch and the clean, <clears throat> in the snatch, you have to get the bar to a certain height. Okay, it's gonna be much higher to get under it. In the clean, the shorter the pull actually is better. A lot of people say, well, how can you say that? Well, now, when you say a short pull, do you mean not opening their hips or do you mean just the bar not getting as high? Um, well, the bar is not going as high. Basically, what you, in the clean, it's a quick shrug and jump under it. You know, if you, There's a certain test which I do with athletes. Uh, I use a PVC stick and I line them up against the wall here to face you know, where the bar is actually, or the, or the stick is actually uh, touching the wall and I let them stay on their toes and shrug. And you see the height as a certain height, the bar is at a certain height. And then when I ask them to go into a front squat position, they're actually sitting lower mm -hmm. than the shrug position, which is good. Now you know that that's all you need. The height's enough just to for the for the shrug and going up on your toes. You don't need to pull it anymore. So you're showing them that if they stand and shrug with the bar, right. that bar is already high enough, it's high for enough them to, to be in the bottom it. of a front squat. That's it. Got it. And that's how you catch the rebound. Okay, talk about the rebound. What does the that mean? The rebound is the bar is, you know, so the Olympic bars, especially the legal bars, have a lot of spring to it. Okay. All right, if you catch it right by not over pulling it by bar crashing down on you, mm -hmm. you catch it at the bottom position, the bar will actually spring itself up where you're almost coming up out of a front squat halfway without any really effort. Because you're saying the weights are going to kind of bend down on bend each down, side. Exactly. Back it's back. like a spring. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. and, and so a really good weightlifter is going to catch that? That's Well, those the most efficient weightlifters find that position. Okay. So that's a level that I don't think we're talking about very much at our level <laughs> ones. <laughs> no. no. And that's the whole idea. It's catch that position mm -hmm. where you're not over pulling it. Unfortunately, we keep thinking we have to pull on the ball. We keep saying... Pull, pull. What are you pulling? You're pulling too hard. Right. The bar is crashing down on you, and then your legs are gone. Okay. Right. And I the think bar that, collapses. And on I you. think that's a huge point for a lot of our that's people a, out there. Very where much if, so. if you if you constantly feel like the bar is crashing down on you, you're it, pulling too high. You're pulling too high. Pulling too high, not getting no. down quickly. And also, I noticed a lot of crossfits they pull backwards. I, I don't know why they they tend to look almost. To, you know, you have to keep your shoulders over the bar at all times. And I noticed that the second pull, they're pulling backwards and the bar gets out in front. If you pull backwards, what's going to happen to the bar? It's going to go out it's in front. It's going to go out in front. So, you know, and what? it's going to crash down on you. I think there's a lot of uh, mis misunderstanding of the physics of the movement. When, when people look at a still frame of somebody with their knees are in front of the bar and their chest is behind the bar right before they release it. Right. And, and they, the thought is, I have to get to a tall vertical position before I move the bar, when in reality, they're, they're now no. at a biomechanical disadvantage. It, exactly. The shoulders never go behind the bar. The shoulders are always over the bar. In the clean, the second pull starts right above the knee. Okay. Okay, in the snatch... When you say the second pull, the, that's when you That's when you, that's go when you accelerate. Broke. That's when you accelerate. Okay, but your shoulders stay over the bar. You do not lean back. Okay. So it's a quick pull, quick shrug, and you jump under it. A lot of athletes, which I taught to do that movement, they come right out of the clean. They'll notice that they bounce right out of it. Mm -hmm. And the clean becomes a lot easier. 
and it gives them enough energy to jerk the weight. In the snatch, it's about two inches, three inches above the knee. Okay. And now... And shoulders always over the bar. Right, so the whole time right. until you're under it. A lot of CrossFitters, I noticed that the biggest mistake they do, they go back on their heels. You can't jump when you go back on your heels. Try to do a jump when you're on your heels. You can't. You lose all your power. You must stay flat-footed. I, I see that also. I'm, I'm the weightlifting coach, but I see that in the start position too, right? I mean, where, where... Right from the start position, they go back on their heels. You have to stay flat-footed and shoulders over the bar. You mm -hmm. lift with your legs, keep your starting position, mm -hmm. and when the bar reaches two or three inches above the knee with the shoulders over, you shrug and jump. Makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> so... Talk to me about some strength, right? So if I want to be able to clean 300 pounds, clean and jerk 300 pounds, for example, what do I need? Like, what kind of reserve strength do I need to have? What do I need to be squatting well, to do that? Well, it's it's actually a strength program. Basically, it goes by weeks. It's, it's, it's a program. Okay. You have to follow it. It's whether you train five days a week, uh, you know, three days, five days. Most likely, you want to train six days. But it's a certain amount of repetitions you need to do per month. Roughly, it's about 2,000 repetitions a month. 2,000? Two, 2,000. Uh, 2, of, of all lifts together. Squat, okay. snatch. Oh, I, I thought you meant squat. Over, now, it all depends what cycle you're on. You might be on the cycle of just getting, like, the strength, the strength cycle, which is about 60 to 75% of your one rep max, and you, you start counting the reps at that point. And at the end of the month, you, you do about meaning, 2, meaning my warm up reps don't count. It's not until I get to that seventy percent. Yeah, sixty, no. about sixty percent. Okay. And you work up to seventy five percent. And how many reps am I doing in a set like that? Uh, it, it all well. You have to count. You remember, you're counting the reps uh, with the squat included. You have to at the end of the week, you need five hundred reps. I see. You can break it up any way you want. Okay. So okay. you're so you're less of a. Five by five, eight by three, kind of a situation. That's more average of... because when you do seventy-five percent, it's actually what seventy-five percent is usually about five reps, six reps. Now, when you go to eighty-five percent, now the now what happens to the reps? It goes less. Right. You do triples. Right. To like three. Ninety percent doubles. Ninety to ninety-five percent. Mm -hmm. Hundred percent one rep. Right. Now you go through it. That's a different uh, period. The shock period is basically where you go to sixty, seventy-five percent. <clears throat> Then there's a stage where you go to the com competitive stage. Now the weight gets heavier. Competitive stage meaning what? The, the load gets much, the intensity goes higher, but the, but the load, the volume gets less. Okay. All right. Um, what I mean by that is now the percentages goes higher. You're working with maybe 85 to 90% or 95%. Mm -hmm. But instead of now thinking about going to 2,000 reps, it goes down to like maybe 1,600 reps a month. Okay, so I'm reducing by about 20%. You're suited by t 10, 15, sometimes it, it all depends on how the athlete can take that type of load. So how many days a week would you have somebody doing it? Well, it goes, it goes by a period of time. So let's say for the next two weeks, we're going to go where it's going to be like, or the next three weeks, it's a shock period where we're only working with 75%. That's the majority of work you do or to get stronger. It's not heavy weights all the time. You can't, the nervous system can't take it. Right. It's too much on the nervous system. Basically, it's about 70, it's 60 to 75%. So you do that for a period of time. Okay. All right. So it's not like we do that. So you, you stick with that. Then you go through maybe a recovery stage where you go a little bit lighter. Then you go through what you call the competitive stage, where now the intensity goes a lot higher and the volume is, is lowered. All right, we're going to get into that a little bit more in a second. I want to give people an opportunity to watch a video about some of the programs that we put out for. Sure, go right ahead. So let's go ahead and roll that. Roll tape, let's Super Clear. Roll that beautiful bean footage. Perfect. You And we're back. Okay. So when we when we broke, you were talking a little bit about 
uh, lighter percentages, like 60 to 75%, then right. you got into like 85 to 95%. Right. There's different stages. Okay. You have to go through. Like, you have to plan. Are we talking about stages in terms of like there's a meet coming up on exactly. January 1st? You, you, okay. You train for a meet. Okay. Okay. So you count how many weeks. Uh, let's say it's 38 weeks that you have the next meet. So you count 38 down. 37. 36. So you recommend 30, a 38 week program it for It could example. be any meet. You have to figure out when's your next meet. Okay. okay? Got it. It, it could be any period of time, but you count down. Okay. All right. And you were saying before about the squat. Well, there were a lot of lifters that concentrated on their squat and got their squat up and kind of like neglected the lifts a little bit. And when they went back to lifts, it didn't, there was no correlation really. Right. It took time before that actually um, we got recruited to the lifts. So it's not how much you squat, it's the whole program together. You have to do a certain amount of squats per month or mm -hmm. per week. You have to do a certain amount of pulls. You have to do a certain amount of lifts together and that's what makes you stronger and you do have a test date where you it's like um a competition could be a local competition or a gym competition you have to f you have to pick out that date and you train for that date mm -hmm. to see if you're on target so you have a goal what is your goal your goal shouldn't in weightlifting your goal is not to squat a certain weight it's to snatch and clean a jerk a certain weight so you have to think about okay what do i need to do What's the workload I need to do to hit X amount of snatch or X amount of clean and jerk? So you have to give yourself a period of time, okay? In 12 weeks, I like to do these lifts. Now, how do I prepare for that? Now you have to write a program out. Okay, I know for the next two weeks, I'll do what 75%, uh, 60 to 70%, that's my shock period. Then I go through my competitive stage and I'll do that for maybe a week or maybe two. Okay, most likely a week where I'm going very heavy Okay, where I'm going from anywhere from 85 to 95 percent, the volume now is is decreased by 10 percent or more. Right. And now you start training with a heavier weight. Then you do a recovery period, where now you need to really decrease the volume and the intensity, and then you could peak out for that meet. Okay. Or, and you, then you start going a little bit heavier. Anytime you you should go a little bit heavier, about 80 percent before a competition or before you test it. You don't want to go too light. Right. You want to have the body right because the body gets used to light weight light weight. So it's moving slow and it starts moving slow and all of a sudden you feel like, okay, I'm only handling sixty percent, which is very light, fifty percent, and then try to go ninety percent, it's gonna feel like a ton. So your coaches were Soviet coaches, right? Yes. Is there a does everyone over there have the same program? Because I mean what one of the things that we talk about all the time is that you're you're not a coach because you took a course. Right, you're not a coach because you went for a weekend and took a course, and now all of a sudden, you you know we're calling you something well, different. I'll tell you the system what they have. I just came back from Ukraine. Okay. I, I took um, I took a certification, a, a strength and conditioning and weightlifting certification, at the university in Kiev. Uh, that was once called the Institute of Physical Culture, of Kiev, when it was the Soviet Union. Uh, there were only a few schools in Russia, like top three schools. One was in Moscow. Uh, the other one, I think, Leningrad um, or Minsk. Not too many, but these were the top schools for weightlifting. To become a coach in Russia, and I, and I believe it's also today too, you have to first go to college and graduate. They are coaching. They have specialized coaching programs, degrees. That's all for weightlifting. So I go, I go to high school, then I go to college, and I'm already starting my – I'm going to be a coach a, one day. But you're already an athlete because you have to be also – a, 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 before you get to these colleges, it's like recruiting. Like um, it's like going to Division One football. Like you know, you have to be already a good student, and you have to be a decent athlete. They will not take you at the top universities if you're not a good, decent lifter already. So if you're going to this like these big schools, universities, mm -hmm. it's like you're going to, like from high school kid who has a lot of talent. He's going to a Division One school. So these kids are talented anyway. Okay. All right. So once they graduate, they take a four-year course or sometimes a five-year course. When they graduate, now they have a coaching degree. Okay. And then the state, the government, gives you a job. <laughs> coaching. Yes. Okay. That's the state. You to give you a job. Also, you have to be also a master level athlete too. So I can't just go out there and be like, "Hey, no, guys, I used to coach." It's unheard of. Here. It's unheard of over there. Well, I remember you you telling me about the program where, like, you saying you you come in as an athlete. 
and that yeah. you get assigned like a basically like a senior would be assigned to a freshman. Right. right? They watch you and they train you and, mm -hmm. and you you have to now you you have to perform. Right. And then you have to go to classroom hours. And then you have to also help someone out. You you're younger mm -hmm. uh, athletes. Right. So you that, so that a, 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 right. a your you have to be a good athlete. You get in. Right. And now you so, have to so, teach. So now, you have now, to learn. Well, right. now you're getting coached your first right. few years. And then you have to start coaching. And then too. now you need to take someone who's younger right. than you and build them up. And then up build to them up a little bit correct. to level. Yeah. Okay. That's so cool. I wish you did that here. So right. many people just go from I'm a good athlete, so I'm gonna start coaching people. No, it right. doesn't work by that. Right. It's the education, and you'll see that all the top coaches that work on the world team, mm -hmm. they're not 20 years old, 25 years old. No. Right. They, you have to earn that spot. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Yeah. It, it's something that you, uh, they're a lot older and a lot more mature. Sure. You know, yeah. there's too many, it's very hard, look, look, it's very hard for someone, and I hate to say this, for someone 25, 26 years old, and now you're a coach. Mm -hmm. You have no experience, okay, and what have you done yourself? <laughs> right. So it, it's very difficult. Usually the best coaches are a little bit, you know, athletes who do retire, have the experience. Because it's not just coaching, giving a program. Do you see what the athlete's doing wrong? It's the eye. Right. Can you see someone, if they're on their heels or not? Are they pulling in the right position? Are the shoulders over the bar? All right, it's hard to do that when you're a competitive athlete yourself. Because you're really thinking about you think about your next training session, what you have to do. Right. We talked with uh, a few people who are high level athletes about the fact that you, you kinda need to be a little bit selfish if you're gonna be good. You are selfish. You have to there's no other way. When I was an athlete, I was selfish. You could coach people, really pretend to do it, that's great. You, you need some type of help. But you don't first of all you don't have the experience and you don't know what to look for yet. Mm -hmm. right. Coaching is the only thing about looking to see what every it, it's everything is, has to be about detail. Can you see everything? part of the lift and what they're doing is wrong and can you correct it can, how do you communicate to the athlete and actually make the changes that takes experience sure yeah, yeah a lot of people can see it right well, see it. how so, do you correct it some though? people can see it yeah how, right. how, how do you, you correct, correct it? it well and, and that's just in the gym right what, what right. struck me when we were talking about your ukraine experience was that was one part what, what were the other parts of of that curriculum over there because it was about recovery there was a larger focus oh reco everything's about recovery rest um, one thing about the camps there what I did find out with the national team they have doctors on staff dentists massage therapists nutritionists you live there it's it's you're away from everyone how long have you guys been there I it's based on maybe it could be like may I'm could be wrong it's about six to eight weeks okay and they prepare themselves um, it's, it's a beautiful facility I, I've seen it uh, and they have one head coach that runs a, and a, a, co a few assistant coaches. Yeah. Well, so, and, well, and you were saying they, they have their training session. Yes, they and get, right from the training session, they go right to massage. Right, and then from and massage, they go, the they go to the, to the nutrition. nutrition. Right. <laughs> yes. so that's, and yeah. the same thing. Everything right. so is done. It's a 24 hour It's a 24 hour thing. Yeah. They eat very good food. Everything everything's done correctly for the athlete. It's almost like our professional athletes here. That's what they are. They are professional. The government takes care of them. Right. It's a little bit difficult here because this is not really a sponsor. But they take it to a science, oh. so. That's well, a but it's a different system over there. Every, you know, being that they were communist and everything was state-run, that's their system, right? right? When you look at the, the Chinese and the Russian, the, the old Soviets, that was the Chinese, their form of government. Well, that's why the Chinese are so good right t today. Because it's still a communist country, the government still has a hold of it. And with the government that has a hold of it, they do things the right way. There's in no terms of weightlifting. Systems. There's no different. See, you can, <laughs> we're talking about weightlifting. Right. Well, <laughs> there's no. What I mean, but like, if you could, like here, every coach has a different system. Right. Right. No, there's one system there. So you're. So I want to get into that because I think that's really interesting. We've talked about it before. The idea that if you're a weightlifter in China, you are on the same weightlifting system that everybody Everyone's else. Everyone's the same. The program, the the queuing, all you of it. You graduate from the college. They teach you technique. They teach you the system, and that's it. It's done. Right, and the same thing in, in, in Europe. Or in Russia, it's, it's, right. it's a system. They so, did so much research. See, that's the difference. They do the research. It's not here. Where's the research done here? I don't. They, I would imagine they did at least some at the Olympic uh, training facility in well, Colorado. That's why it's closed. <laughs> 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 and I, I hear you. All right. I hear you. Uh, yeah, a lot of research. <laughs> so, what I mean, how... How does America catch up? 
then you it, it's, without it's without, without you know, going backwards you know economically. how do you really we have a talent here that's just it. We, we have great athletes here because we have talent. And also, mm -hmm. if you look at our supplements, our foods, we have some of the best nutrients in the world. When my coach came here from the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. I took him to like Wallbaums to the supermarket. He almost nearly passed out. <laughs> he never saw so much food in his life or meat. When I took him to the meat area, he goes, the average American eats better than actually an Olympian, a gold medalist in Russia. How do you guys not win all the gold medals? We don't have that. Well, and, There's no system. And, 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 and American athletes and American coaches often point to the idea that, oh, well, you don't see Americans getting popped for steroids in the Olympics, and you see Europeans getting popped well, for all That's time. another thing about steroids. Look, you can say anything you want. The steroid does not make the athlete. You have right. to work for it. Well, that's, that's the thing that we always and talk about, I, too, I don't but. know about, you know, I don't know about any American. Look, look we have American runners that got caught. Sure. Look, you know, unfortunately, where, where, where there's money, there's drugs. There's money, there's drugs. Look, I'm not going to say that, you know, American athletes are 100% clean. I don't know. Right. All right. Do I think that steroids, look, I'm not, I'm not for steroids. I'm not. No, so. you, you said something interesting before that was, you know, a, a Russian guy who you say to him, hey, you take steroids and, and, and that's why you well, win. Yeah, we'll say, well, say hey, they do they what say, I do. Do what I do. Yeah. Right. Even if the Russians got popped or whatever, you know, do what they do. S right. Take the drugs and see if you could do the same. Right. <laughs> yeah, do, you, do you have the work capacity to work as hard? They trained to lay almost, Klokov said, my coach put me in a place where I don't want to be in. Mm -hmm. And he survived it. Right. So it's, it's actually survival of the fittest. That's sure. What they do. Well, and that's, that's yeah. what we talk about all the time. Yeah. The idea that, you know, this program works for the guy who survives it. No. Right. Everybody else gets. Look, I have athletes right. now that I trained at a national level, they cannot take, they cannot survive the load. Right. I don't want to mention his name because I No, no, him, no, you don't need to mention anybody's but name. But he cannot take a load, cannot. Right. Mm -hmm. Your body, it, it's also your health, how strong your heart is to survive a load. Everyone recuperates differently. Mm -hmm. You also have to have a big appetite. People don't realize for strength sports, if you have a small appetite, it never happens, it'll never be strong. I remember, sure. you know, I remember coaches in Russia told me like, Many years ago, if you hired someone to do farm work, hard labor, you would invite him over to dinner. If you saw he had a big appetite, you'd hire him. He could have, he has the capacity <laughs> to do a lot of work. That's it. I like that. Small appetite, you're not going to do a lot of work. Right. A big appetite, you have to work. So weightlifters have to eat mm -hmm. to get stronger because you need to work. You need to eat, I guess, for five people and train for three. You need to work mm -hmm. hard. Sure. But yeah. there's no, like going back to what you said, they, they, they get the American weightlifters up to European standards. We have to break down the whole system, come up with a school like they do in Russia and Ukraine and those other former Soviet countries, graduate, do the research, and then have one system in line, and everyone goes on the same system. But now everybody's a coach here. Right. Why we do so well is that we have talent. Mm hmm all right, is it really the coaching or is it because America has great talent and also we have great supplements here? Right. Our protein, everything is, is, superior, is superior to the world. Sure. How can, you, how can you not do well? Well, it's always been interesting to me that we, we dominate, you know, basketball, track and field, other sports that are, I'm not going to say, uh, they're not power sports, but or, I mean, track and field can be a power sport, but we dominate all these other sports. Weightlifting is just that one that's like we just no, get our ass kicked. But don't but don't forget, back in the eighties, we didn't dominate track and field. The Russians did. They won more over. In nineteen eighty eight was the last Olympics that they won more. No, ninety two actually. Even when it broke <clears> down, if you look at, at all the records, they won more medals than anyone else. In nineteen eighty eight, East Germany got more medals than the United States. A small country like East Germany. I didn't know that. Yep. Really. So Soviets did very well in track and field. Track and field, the Soviets did very, very well in track and field, especially when it comes to the throwing events. Right. All, all the Eastern Bloc countries. Sure. Even we did better at, even though the 100, they were very competitive, 100, 200, the 400, all Eastern Europeans. It could be Russian, and all the Eastern Europeans were taught by Russia, Soviet, by the Soviet Union. Yeah, they were dominating. They dominated. The whole You're, system is all by Soviet culture. Once they graduate the college, they also were sent to different countries. Or different satellites, you know, other yeah, communist republics countries, out there. republics, or even Cuba. You see, okay. all that's a, that's a Soviet system, training. right? Okay. I think you were gonna you were gonna talk about something about the the recovery it looked like before, and then we kind of buried it. 
No, no, no. We hit it. Just the, the nutrition and the oh. and the the massage and, and and it's that that becoming a coach over there is not simply an I and cueing. That becoming a coach over there is really having a full, all encompassing understanding right. of the athlete and the organism. That well, you're not coaching. only that, understand the nervous system. Weightlifting is all about nervous system. That's what you recruit. You, you you're recruiting neuro. The difference between weightlifting and bodybuilding. Bodybuilding, think about it. You're not going that's heavy. You're working more muscular. Mm -hmm. Okay, to grow size. Mm -hmm. Weightlifting is neuro. You notice every time you go over eighty percent, you start to psych up. Now you're recruiting what? The nervous system. And that takes a big load on the body. Mm -hmm. That's that's why you notice that out of all the sports in the Olympics, weightlifting is only one time event. You don't have any like pre events, trials. Right. Right. Like in track and field, you do a hundred meter run, that's the first trial, then you go to the second one, then you finally go to the finals. All right, that's true. I never thought of that. Look at all the different sports. Look at all the weightlifting is the only one, one final. So you just show up. That's yeah. right. You six show lifts. up and the six lifts. But every time you do a lift, look how much it tax the nervous system. You gotta psych up for every lift. Mm -hmm. At a hundred percent. You're exhausted. It takes two weeks to recover from that. Really from that one day. It takes two weeks to recover. Yeah. That's why you can't compete. You sh a true weightlifter only competes about two or three meets a year mm -hmm. where they peak out. The rest are just tests to see if you're going in the right position, in the right, in the, in the right way. So the majority of the time when they're, when they're doing these other meets, other than their big three, their A, they're they're a going, level, they're, 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 they have B, right. they just kind of like, okay, it's going to go. Usually it's the World Championships, the Olympics, and the, and the European Championships. And sometimes, even, even the European champions, they might not go 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, and the nationals, because they want to make the stop. They have right. a few meets you only. Make some money that, from your government you nationals. Know, right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's basically a few meets a year. They really peak out. Mm -hmm. And the rest, they just, you know, maybe they might do a local competition. Or just, that's a test day to see if they're in the right, you know, okay. a heavy day. A okay. heavy workout day. Cool. So I remember you talked to me one time. You were writing some squat program for me. It was working. I hit a little squat PR. Yeah. And I was like, when does this end? And you said, when you feel like you have the flu, we'll deload. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> what you do is you have to tack. What you do is you, you overload the body right. for a period of time. Then you have to deload and recovery. Then you go back. It's, it's, it's a wave. Mm -hmm. And everyone, for everyone who does it, that wave is going to be different. It, can be, yeah, it all depends on the recovery of the person. But basically, it's, you, you don't try to deviate away. With, this is how it is. Right. If you can't take it, basically look for another sport. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, it's true. I, I hate to say, but that's what they look at. It's not for everyone. And and, and that's you know? that goes back to what we've talked about over and over again. The idea that like, listen, yeah, this is this strength building program that you're talking about will work for the person who can survive it, and the person who survives right. it and it works for it goes to the Olympics. Right. Exactly. It's right. Er everybody else who tries to do it. It might not work. They they either can't keep up with no. it or they break down. They break down. Right. And that's why. I have an athlete now that tried to do the program, but they didn't stick with the percentages. It was too light. Mm -hmm. Now they're trying to go heavy, and that it's not really working that well because they went from one extreme to another. They felt they felt good. Right. They're like, I'm going to go heavier oh, than I'm supposed to. No, well, you're going too light. You have to stick to the percentages. That's how it works. Oh, they went too light. I they went. Yeah, they say, well, I can't recover. Right. It's too heavy. So instead of handling anywhere from 60 to 75, they went to 50 to 60 percent. That's not the program. Right. If you can't recover, well, do more to recover then. Go mm -hmm. in the sauna. Eat more. How many days a week do you have guys squatting? Uh, almost every day. Every day they train or like seven every days? Every day. Six days. I'm sorry. Six days. Basically, sometimes six days a week. Five days a week. That's crazy. So you really got to want it. You got to want it sometimes twice a day. <laughs> do you get a participation award if you can't do it? Well, no, that's the problem we have in this country. <laughs> well, see, that, you just a lot of participation it. awards well, out there. You know, it is, I spiked your blood pressure a little it's bit, too. Unfortunately, yeah, you know, th this really gets to me. Is like I don't understand why we do this here, that everyone has to win a trophy. You know, Everyone wins. No, we have winners and they're losers. And if the sport's not right for you, for any sport, um, find something else. It's not fair for even a young athlete, little Johnny who can't play baseball, but he has to win something. And the, and the kid who has talented, could never reach his potential because he's lowered by someone who can't play. No, I, I like it. You know, uh, that's not fair. It's not for him. It's not. That's why the Chinese, they don't care about that. It's not being politically correct. Can't play, find something else. I think he's telling us our camera's cut itself off. So, 
about to cut itself off. I don't think we should go any further anyway. That was a great way to end this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, it was. I appreciate you I coming out. I keep going after, after the camera's turned off. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what are you saying? Cut. Yeah. All right. So that was a pretty good spot to let off, right? Uh, I don't think we should go any further with that. I think no. that if anything else we're going to say from there is just going to be downhill. Um, <laughs> that was a high point for me. That's still good, though. It's, it could be good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we can go on forever. But uh, Joe Gazio. I, I don't think I made a lot of friends. No, you did. Trust me, you did. I made a lot of friends. Uh, a lot of people think that. Joe Gazio, guys, if you, got, if you want to find Joe Gazio on Instagram or social media, at uh, Joe, Coach, Coach Joe, Joe WL. WL. What is it, he says. <laughs> he, uh, it's a good program. <laughs> Maybe not the best photos, but yeah, it's a great you program. Post, you post your program every day, yes, right? Yeah, Get on south. there. A lot of knowledge out there for you guys. All right. We'll talk to you next time. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Bye-bye.